Let us take a few minutes and have a Bible study together, noticing the concept that the Father knows how to give. Maybe I could ask this question and someone sitting next to you may end up answering it for you. Are you a good gift giver? Now, if you're sitting by somebody in your family, they may look at you and go, man, you're good. And they might look at you and say, you need help. Maybe that's what it is. Let me tell you something. It's not that you're not a good gift giver because somebody walks up to you and says, I want this, go get it. That doesn't make you a good gift giver. What makes you a good gift giver is you say, hmm, I want this person to have this. I know them. I know who they are. This is special to them. That's a good gift giver. Now, Wednesday night when we get here, we're going to all be together, and we're going to talk about, we're going to have a discussion about the uniqueness of God's gift. And we're going to look at John 3, verse 16. And I am, in fact, going to wear one of my unique, special gifts that I was given. I have a few, but I'm going to wear one of them. Now, if there's something like that that you can sort of have in your possession, uh, something that you, you would wear that would fit that occasion, go ahead and do it Wednesday night, and we're going to talk about the only begotten. Because the Father knows how to give, and He is the good gift giver. Now, right now, we're going to notice that the Father knows how to give. Noticing these two passages together, we'll begin in Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to compare and contrast uh, this verse with the one in Luke chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, whether in page form or smartphone form or tablet form or... And I don't even know what other devices there are. I don't have a clue. But if you have any of those... Uh, I expect to see them in your hands, and we're going to walk through it right quick together, okay? Matthew chapter 7. And there are, by the way, Bibles underneath the seat in front of you, potentially. I wonder how long it will be before we start putting tablets under there. Probably never. All right. Matthew 7, the text of verse 11, has the context. You know what's happening here. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. His major reason for this whole Sermon on the Mount was to talk to his disciples who had gathered around him. And he's telling them what it means to be a disciple. He's comparing chapter 5 and contrasting the old law and the new. And he talks about daily living in chapter 6. And in chapter 7 he talks about this whole concept of giving your life to the Lord. Now look in chapter 7, verse 7 beginning. It's that famous passage. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be opened. And he talks about verse 9 starting. You know how to give gifts to your children, right? No man is going to give his son a stone if he says he wants some bread. And, and nobody is going to give his child a snake if he asks for a fish. And therefore, he uses that concept and he says, verse 11, If then, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. Will not your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? See, the principle that He has laid down in these verses is a general principle for the people of God. Jesus says God knows how to give to His children. Generally speaking, ask it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. But then notice how he applies it in verse 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now he takes this general principle. God knows how to give, and he gives the way that is best, and he knows how to give to you. Therefore, you do the same to them. If they ask for this, don't give them this. 
You know how to give good gifts. God knows how to give good gifts to His children. There is the general principle. Now go to Luke chapter 11. Now in Luke chapter 11, we have what appears to be the exact same words, but in a different context. Now in Luke chapter 11, the context had begun back in chapter 11, verse 1, came to pass as He was praying in a certain place, when he had ceased, his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, they had come to him and had a question in a silent or a private kind of thing. Tell us how to pray. And in teaching them the prayer, he, he gave a, a concept of prayer, verses 2 through 4. And then in verse 5, he tells that parable, right? That story about the man who uh, had a friend who came to him in the middle of the night and said, can you give me something to eat? I need something to set before them. But it's late. Don't trouble me. The door is shut. My children are in bed with me. I cannot. Verse 7, verse 8, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as he needs. Jesus said, therefore, here's the point. Keep asking. Come to God and ask. Now he's talking about something specific. Generally, Matthew 7 God gives. Now specifically, notice how he applies it. He uses the same terminology, ask it will be given, seek you will find, knock it will be opened, verse 9. He uses the same son-father arrangement. And then in verse 13 he says the same thing almost. Now he says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, instead of it being a general principle that applies to life, God knows how to give, He says, now the Father knows how to give. He will give the Holy Spirit to anybody who asks Him. And a reference, therefore, I think, to anybody who wants to be one of the children of God. Anybody who wants to be in the family of God and have the Spirit of God certainly has the opportunity to do. And the Father knows how to give. So it seems to me, <clears throat> chapter 7 of Matthew, it is a general thing. Chapter 11 of Luke, it is the general principle applied in a specific way to having the Spirit or becoming a disciple of the Lord. Now let's branch out of that. What does it mean that the Father knows how to give? That's what Jesus said. The Father knows how to give. All right, what does that mean? Let me give you these ideas for you to think about with respect to the Father knowing how to give. Number one, the Father gives to those who ask Him. That's what the text said, right? Ask, it will be given. The Father gives to those who ask. Now let us establish a principle found in 1 Peter chapter 3. Let us remind ourselves, 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning verse 10. God promises to interact or to work in behalf of His children in a way or in ways different than He reacts to people who are not His children. Verse 10. 1 Peter 3. He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Now notice this verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is a quotation from Psalm 34 and verse 15. What does it say? God's ears are open to the prayers of the righteous. What that means is this. God deals with His righteous disciples, His children. He listens to their prayers and responds to their prayers in ways that are different than the response he has to those who are not his children. Phil Montgomery, Drew Alexander, Luke Mathis have been involved in our 
helping disseminate our benevolent work through them. Now, every one of them, when they're called, they're willing to get involved and work in behalf of whomever it is that we've called them about. But you can rest assured that if one of their children calls them, it just raises the level of their involvement. Makes sense, right? Their own children call, their own children say they're much more willing, able, and quick to jump because that's my child. God responds to his children in ways that are different than he responds to those who are not. But, what the text say? God gives to all who asks. Ask, you receive. Seek, you will find. Knock, it will be opened. To everyone who asks, he receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And everyone who knocks, it is opened. Here's what I think that means. It means, number one, that any person who is not his child, God responds to them, not, well, Every person is his child. There are some who are his children by creation only. He created them. So to those who are his children by creation only, he responds to them by saying, that's a seeking heart, and I will send them the gospel. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, not a Christian, but a good man. A man who gave alms and a man who prayed. The indication is that because he prayed, because he was a seeker, God responded to his prayers by sending a preacher to teach him the gospel. So God deals with people who are not his children, who ask and who talk to him. They're good people. They are on board with things that are good and right and moral. What does he do for them? Does he retreat them the same way that he treats his children who are spiritually in his family? Well, I don't think that's possible to be true. But he also does not turn a deaf ear. He sees them as a seeking heart, I think. And, and the gospel message gets to them in some way. That's how God responds to their asking. But those of us who are children, not only by creation, but also by recreation, he helps us physically and spiritually. Luke 18, 1, you should, Jesus said, pray and always and don't faint. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Matthew 5, verse 11, even in that prayer, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. It's a way of physically connecting with God on the most basic nature of life, food. In James chapter 5, he reminds us, if any are sick, let them ask for the elders of the church and let them come and lay hands on them and pour oil on them. And the prayer of sick or the prayer of the faithful will save the sick, and I'll raise him up. And if any sins have been committed, I will forgive them. Why? Because the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Christians can pray and move God in ways that those who are not Christians cannot do. The question Does God hear a sinner's prayer? Yes, meaning. Does God know that sinners are praying? Well, sure. Does God hear a sinner's prayer in the same way that he hears a Christian's prayer? No, he does not. A Christian who prays has the ear of God to affect the actions of God, to change, to move. But the prayer of a non-Christian is seen by God as an opportunity to change and move the one who is praying. So number one, the Father knows how to give. He gives to all who ask. Number two, He knows how to give because He gives to all who don't 
ask. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Very briefly, we can make this point. Starting in verse 43, notice there's an interesting phrase that sort of just is thrown in here, as it were. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy and, or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For, here it is, he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. You remember that little statement in the prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Did Jesus say, pray that phrase so that you will be sure to have something to eat every day? Why no? Plenty of people refuse to acknowledge that God has any hand in that. Plenty of people refuse to pray, and yet they eat every single day. You know why? Because God gives to people who don't ask. Every day, the sun comes up and goes down. And every season of the year passes and gives great benefit to the land that God created. He sends the rain on the good and on the unjust. Every day that the sun comes up, whether he admits it or not, an atheist is confronted with the fact that God gave him the sun for that day. And God gave him the rain for that day. Did he ask for it? Did he appreciate it? Not at all. Because God knows how to give. And the Father gives even to those who do not ask. Number three, the Father knows how to give. He gives us what we ask for. First John. Chapter 5. This is a text that we could spend a lot of time with. There are a number of different things that come up in this text that have that come up in question form. Uh, we'll just consider one or two of them. We start in verse 14, 1 John 5 and 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who do not commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Consider this verse, or these verses, this way. God gives to us what we ask for. But now notice the stipulation here. Verse 14. If we ask according to his will, he hears us. Any prayer that is in accordance with the will of God is a prayer that God hears. That opens up two possibilities. One, I know what the will of God is. And if I know what the will of God is, and I say, God, that's what I'm in line with, that's what I want to be done, then I am praying that his will that I know will be done. But what if I don't know what the will of God is? What if I don't know exactly the what God wants in a particular situation? What if I don't know how to direct my life in some ways, like directions of where I'm going to live and work and do? Those kinds of things, if I put those in the hands of God, His will will be worked, but I don't know what it is. So in that case, I'm praying, God, you do your will. Whatever it is, just help me to see it and know it. So I have to pray, number one, for Him to hear according to His will. Number two, He gives us an example of what we cannot pray for. Verse 16. If you see a brother committing a sin not leading to death, ask, and he will have life for that sin. In other words, there is a sin that someone commits not leading to death, and I can pray for that situation, 
and forgiveness can come. But then he goes on to say, but if there's a sin that leads to death, you can't pray for that one. What is he talking about? Well, think about it this way. Is there any sin too big for God to forgive? No. Can anybody be forgiven of any sin, whatever the sin might be or might have been? Yes. Now keep in mind, there's a difference between consequences of sin and guilt of sin. Two different things. God removes guilt. He does not always remove consequences. There are times when sin happens and the consequences are here. And we can be forgiven of the guilt, but we still face the consequences. That is life. What's he talking about? Here's what I think he's saying. If you see your brother's sin, a sin not leading to death. Why is it not leading to death? Because he's repented of it. Then you pray for that person as well. And through you and that person's prayers together, I'll help them. But what if you see a brother over here sinning and he's refusing to repent? Refusing to get right. He says, you can't pray for that. In other words, you can't pray, God, forgive that person, even though they don't want to repent. That's not his will. I don't have the right to do that. I cannot even utter that prayer. I cannot say, God, forgive him in spite of himself. So if I know the will of God and I pray for that, and I don't know the will of God, but I still want his will to be done, God hears me. You know why? Because he says he gives to those who ask what they ask for. Finally, number four. He gives us what we don't even ask for. Look at Romans chapter 8. This is a good one, I think, to close with in this brief lesson, covering a lot of material that could be in, more, in depth covered even more. Romans chapter 8, we start in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. We're weak people. It helps in our weaknesses. Whatever the weaknesses are, the Spirit of God helps. We're talking about the Holy Spirit living within the Christian. What Jesus said in Luke 11, he'll give the Holy Spirit to those who ask, right? We have the Spirit living within us, and the Spirit living within us helps our weaknesses. What are our weaknesses in reference to this text? We do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We've often and always used that to say, when we're in such pain and agony and difficulty and we can't even find the words to say because we're so distraught and so upset, the Spirit translates and gives the words. Well, I think that's true. I'm not sure that's the only thing this verse means. It seems to me that it could also be Exactly the opposite. We can have so much joy and peace and excitement and wonderful about being a Christian and we're just talking to God about it and we really, the Spirit is saying words that we haven't even uttered, but it's transmitting what we really mean. The point is, I haven't even said it. I haven't asked for it. But the Spirit knows me because He's living within me. And He translates Verse 27, now he who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God, through his Spirit, living in the Christian, uses that as an opportunity. The Spirit is the interceder between the two. Then we know this. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I didn't even ask for it, but I got it. I didn't even know what to say. I didn't know what to word. It just didn't come out. But the Father knows me, and he works in my behalf for what is good. As long as I hold on to the will of God, wanting it to be duplicated and done in my life, wanting him to have full course, full control. The Father knows how to give. 
He gives to all because that's what He is. He is the great giver. God knows how to give. Let us be thankful that in God's giving to us, He always gives what is best when sometimes we ask what turns out to be the worst. One person said, I have lived long enough to be thankful that God did not give me every single thing I ever asked for, but he gave me every single thing that he knew I needed and his will was done in my life. The Father knows how to give. Let us be thankful and grateful to the God who gives. I hope that you will join us on Wednesday night. Come with some thoughts on the only begotten Son of God. What does that mean, only begotten? And we will pursue that Wednesday night. Before we leave this night, if there's one here who needs to have the Spirit put into your life by obedience to Jesus, who has said, all who believe and are baptized shall be saved. We're here for you or for those who need to return to the Lord in a faithful way. We pray for you while we stand and sing together.